Hi, my name is Sean Kelly. I am the Teresa G. and Ferdinand F. Martinetti Professor of Philosophy at Harvard University. I want to talk to you today about what it is to be a human being. I think there's an interesting challenge that we have living at our point in history in the West in thinking about what it is to be a human being and what we aspire to in trying to, in trying to be the best kind of human being that we can. It's a challenge for us that I think is uh, relatively unique and it's not the kind of challenge that people in the past had. I think there are two reasons for that. One has to do with the kind of secular age that we live in. It's not my phrase. Other people call our age a secular age. And the other has to do with the way in which technology influences how we understand what we're up to. First, let me say something about what people mean when they call our age a secular age. Uh, that's in contrast with uh, previous ages, all of them really, but the, the recent previous age that's relevant is the High Middle Ages, where Christianity was the religion that governed most of what happened in the West. Uh, to say that we live in a secular age now doesn't mean that we live in an age where we have no Christian believers. We have plenty, lots of Christian believers. But it means instead that the role that religious belief plays in the lives of people nowadays is different from the role that it used to play in the High Middle Ages. In the High Middle Ages, if you met someone who didn't share your religious belief, then that fact alone was enough for you to conclude that the person you'd met was less than human. We don't allow for that immediate transition anymore, at least if, to, if, we, if we find someone who thinks they have a right to make that transition, we call them a zealot or we call them a fanatic. Uh, for the most part, even people who are religious believers believe that people who don't share their religious beliefs are capable of living good human lives. That's a kind of liberalization of the role that uh, religion plays in the culture, and it has pluses and minuses. The pluses have to do with the fact that we're more pluralistic about the kinds of beliefs that people can have on the basis of which they can live their lives, and therefore we're more pluralistic about the kinds of lives that people can aspire to. Uh, but the minus is that uh, religious belief can't play the role that it used to play in people's lives. It can't in particular play the role of helping you to understand exactly what your life has to allow you to aspire to. Uh, if your religious beliefs are compatible with someone who doesn't hold them living a good life, then your religious beliefs don't ground the kind of life that you've got to live. That's destabilizing, and uh, it's in the context of that kind of destabilization that we now live. In the context of that kind of destabilization, technology comes in and plays uh, a role in directing the kinds of lives that we live. It's not always a role that's helpful it's, I think, a role that sometimes pushes us not to think very hard or very carefully about what we're up to or what we ought to be doing. Think of the way in which technology takes over your life, directs you, uh, allows you to become addicted to it, and allows you not to pay attention to what you ought to be up to. So the secularism of our age and the technological, the impact of technology on our age combine to make it very difficult for us to wonder what we should be up to in living a human life. But in the past, uh, the great literature of the past didn't have this problem. And the great literature of the past is fascinating. And when I teach 
great literature and great philosophy from the period of the ancient Greeks or the ancient Hebrews or the Romans or the Christians or the Middle Ages or the Renaissance or modernity. What I'm interested in is the conception that people have of what they ought to be up to in living a life. And that conception is different at different periods of history. And that gives us a great reserve to draw on if you read these people and try really hard to understand what they took themselves to be up to. They can teach us about possibilities that we have because we live in the wake of their practices that, uh, that we didn't realize that we have. My wife's grandmother um, told me a story once about how her education affected her life. And it's a story that I think is relevant for all of us, even though the details are not relevant. She grew up in China in the 1920s and 30s. And her mother, who was a very tough taskmaster, gave her a very classical Chinese education. It involved memorizing great tracts of classical Chinese poetry. And when she was 10 or 11 or 12, she would have to memorize hundreds of lines of poetry. And I asked her at once, uh, at one point, uh, what it was like to do that. She said it was very difficult. And a lot of the time she wanted to rebel against it, but she didn't. And when she asked her mother why she had to do this, her mother told her an interesting story. She said, these lines of poetry, they, they may not mean anything to you now as a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, a 12-year-old, because you haven't had life experience. But what will happen if you memorize them, if you make them a part of you in the way that you can when you memorize poetry or literature, is that at some point in the future, an event will occur and a line of poetry will pop unbidden into your mind. And the event will make sense in terms of the line of poetry, and the line of poetry will make sense in terms of the event. And in this way, the significance of your life will be tied up with the great history of the culture that you're the beneficiary of. Now, I'm not myself the beneficiary of the particular culture that my wife's grandmother grew up in, and I don't have at my beck and call hundreds of lines of classical Chinese poetry. But we're in the West the beneficiary of an equally fascinating uh, history and culture. And if you put yourself in that relation to that history and that culture, then the questions that we have as modern people living in a secular technological age may at some point find an answer uh, by virtue of that kind of education.